Why the populist dialogues? Populism was a product of an economic system which drove the American people into either greater wealth or abject poverty. From 1873 until 1893, America experienced a devastating economic crisis characterized by falling farm prices and massive urban unemployment. As the poor cotton farmers of East Texas and the South searched for a way out of their poverty, they identified the source of their conditions as the railroads and the East Coast banks. The farmers began to develop a system of farming co-ops and banking mechanisms independent of these powerful institutions. While creating the new systems, the populists advocated for structural changes to the political system. They realized that neither two political parties, Republicans in the North and Democrats in the South, serve them. The two parties were entrenched with the railroads and the banks. A third party was needed that united black, white, and red, as well as urban factory workers with rural farmers. Thus the People's Party, known as the Populists, were born. Our program is called the Populist Dialogues because we identified with these early populists, the principal cause of today's economic, social, environmental, and political problems is the corporate takeover of our democracy. Corporate dominance has eliminated most of our democratic institutions. Most importantly, the American people's active participation in our decision-making processes. Our program's purpose is to inform our audience of the current populist solutions to these problems. We promote true populist ideas and ideals, unlike phony populists who identify government as the source of their oppression and use wedge issues to divide the poor, working class, and the middle class. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, The Populist Dialogues. My name is David Delk and I am host of this series of half-hour weekly public access station programs. Our guests today are my, uh, Greg Margolis and Michael Wade. Uh, Greg is a member of the Portland Jobs with Justice, uh, where he is chair of the Global Justice Trade Committee, as well as being a member of Occupy Portland Labor Solidarity Committee. Uh, and Michael is co-chair of the Economic Justice Action Group at the First Unitarian Church and is also part of Occupy Portland. So welcome to both of you. Thank you, David. Thank yeah. you. So you both worked on uh, what I thought was an exciting uh, project uh, recently, and that is de that was developing a people's budget um, to coincide with the development of the Portland city budget. So what was your objective in, in uh, doing this? Well, this was uh, something that grew out of the Occupy, Portland Occupy Labor Solidarity Committee, uh, but it really started, the idea of it started back in the crash of 08, it actually started like 30 years ago, but we've been making the same struggle for a long time, and that is uh, seeing that uh, the powers that be have put a model of austerity to try to basically uh, cut services and cut jobs for working people and uh, provide a better opportunity for profit instead of the needs of folks. And we saw that in coming up in the city budget, this model was being pushed by our own representatives with no options. In other words, they were talking about uh, uh, laying off laborers, laying off workers in the city that would end certain services like parks, and roads, infrastructure, and other services, uh, laying off people in, uh, that were hired through the city to help uh, uh, nonprofit organizations uh, with things like English as a secondary language. The people who are going to be affected by these cuts and layoffs were the people who could least afford it. And instead of looking for a way to cut, for instance, the taxes uh, on the rich, the, or to cutting the tax breaks to the rich, uh, and cutting the subsidies to the rich to create more revenue so we could take care of people's needs. Uh, it's been going this way. So we want to see a different framing of how the budget process works and who it works for. And so a few people from that uh, uh, Labor Solidarity Committee in Occupy got together and started talking about it and thought let's have an assembly, let's get started, let's do some research into how the budget works 
and uh, where the money is and how we think it should be. So we started that. Okay. Uh, started it in that manner. Okay. And so, how 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 long before the city approved their budget did you start doing this planning? We started towards the end of last year talking about it, and it kind of evolved. And we built a group from three or four of us to uh, about a dozen very committed planners. And during that time, maybe twenty or thirty people got were involved in the process of planning and developing uh, this campaign. I guess you could call it. Uh, and then the budget, I don't know all the specific dates for budget, but the budget still hasn't been finalized, I think, is it the end of, end of June? I'm not sure when it is, but basically what the city does, and I think uh, Michael will talk about this more in terms of process and, and that sort of thing, but what the city does is starts talking about the next budget period in, at the end of the summer, like in September. But they only open it up to the public in March, mm -hmm. after they've done all of the backroom dealing and really made the decisions, and then they just give lip service to the public that they're involved in the process. Well, that's one of the things we want to change. We want it to be uh, par participatory and open uh, process so that we can have a say in how our taxpayer money is used. Okay. All right. And you, you've been part of this process also, uh, Michael? I have. My, my, my role has been primarily, uh, it actually didn't get into the final process as we were doing it because I was studying the city's budget and how the city was, uh, how it had evolved over time, the way the monies were flowing in and out of various accounts in the, in the city's budget. And then I was looking at the process and that's how uh, starting sometime uh, in the early part, late part of the summer, the city starts actually doing the plan. And the uh, city's economist does a revenue forecast that's based on what the laws say, and then a reasonably conservative estimate of what the economic activity is going to be. And out of that generates a forecast that starts the process of talking about austerity, because he can say, and you know, the, the economist office says, we will not have enough revenue to fund services the way we've been doing it. And that's where the whole conversation starts there and goes downhill from there, basically. Okay, <laughs> all right, yeah. And, and so so you looked at the at the city's budget proposal itself? Yes. Okay, yeah. can you tell us some of what you found? Well, um, it's actually never, a, I mean, budget documents are kind of funny this way, that they never really tell the story. Uh -huh. The only thing that you get, the only way you can tell the story is to tell the story over time. So you look at what the budget was and. 2000, and you kind of do you know some kind of a weighted average of, of period uh, over the years of the way the budget looks, and I would say the the main uh, modification I've seen in city revenues is they've gone from income taxes on corporations to fees and uh, fees for services on. Uh, small businesses and, and the like. Okay. And this is within the city you're talking about? Yes, within the city. About, because that, that, sounds like the, that, that sounds like what's happening at the state level. I, I wasn't aware that was what was happening at the city level as well. Right. It's, a, it's a, again, trying to uh, preserve the income of the one percenters. So, and so we charge everyone else <laughs> for the privilege of, right. of being so in instead that. Of, instead of taxing them and instead of taxing corporations on their profits, we instead charge fees to the folks who actually use the services. That's what Correct. you're saying. Correct. Okay. Uh, so, going through the process that you went through, well, describe that process a little bit. Yeah, I, I yeah, just. Well, uh, fill so, it out. <laughs> in terms of in terms of studying, I mean, and and trying to do a little bit of research, we had a couple of different sources of information. Uh, one of the the local unions. Uh, has been in negotiation with the city for quite some time on uh, a couple of issues. And they have a lawyer who went through the budget for the last 10 years and did a, uh, a rather thorough assessment of two, two, uh, two funds, the transportation fund and the internal services funds. And the transportation fund and the, the, and the analysis of that. Yeah. So we got that piece of information and, and we kind of assimilated that into our discussion. And then we uh, had another team of people who actually had some experience in other jurisdictions where um, they had looked at the way urban renewal funds 
were generated and then turned that information to use in Portland and looked at the Portland urban renewal uh, strategies and uh, came up with some c conclusions around that. So we, we put those two things together and made a, I think we have a fairly good argument for uh, the austerity call that we're being uh, pledged to go for mm -hmm. is the wrong call. We need to talk about allocation issues, not about funding issues necessarily. Okay. So did you find more money in the budget that, that oh, yeah. is not being identified <laughs> publicly? Yeah, I think, I, 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 I think what we found is there's money set aside, especially in urban renewal. And again, I the wonkish stuff kind of you know, I just, no more, please. Uh, and part of it is, by nature, it's convoluted and it's it's complex and it makes it so it's hard to understand completely. And I'm sure there's some stuff that are, you know, for a good reason to do it and other things that are done for the benefit of people who can most, uh, you know, get most from uh, the taxes and, and uh, to the... Uh, against the people who need it most. But uh, we found, for instance, in urban renewal, there are funds set aside for like 30 or 40 years when these different projects are done so that uh, those funds can never be used by the city for other needs. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they always have to stay in that urban renewal pot. And in the meantime, it's it's not always possible uh, to develop the kind of jobs and economic health uh, through these projects that the the city is hoping are go, is going to happen where f frankly it benefits high end uh, development mostly rather than the need the real renewal urban renewal needs of the broader community and especially places like East County that are underserved mm -hmm. Uh, and so th that money is there. Your question was about additional money and plus there are, is a reserve fund that the city has and I think it's 125 million or more in reserve. I, I'm not sure of the exact numbers, but um, the uh, Michael was referring to the union that was uh, doing some research, and that's uh, 483, the laborers who take care of our parks and take care of our city streets and and our maintenance and the basic needs that serve all of us. Um, and they're talking about layoffs and cutting back in those departments. So obviously those folks want to keep their jobs, but also it's for the, the greater interest. And I think there's a $17 million shortage, shortfall causing those layoffs and cutbacks. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that 17 million is a, a small percentage of the money that's set aside in reserve. And the city is saying, oh no, we need those reserves in case we need new computers or something like that. In other words, they're not looking at this as, they're not looking at, at, at jobs and the needs of the community as in emergency situations where this money should be used. And we have a very different opinion because every person who gets laid off is another person who faces possible foreclosure, homelessness, poverty, you know, and is reliant mm -hmm. on the social safety net systems that are also being. So it's completely backwards mm -hmm. for us to be making cuts in services and laying off people. It it just makes our, our uh, economy less healthy. Okay. Yeah, so I, my, my conception of how the city, you know, gets money and spends money is that they get money and the amount that they get, they spend. And so, but you're saying that these reserves are money that they're just holding back? For emergencies, yeah. yeah they, part of the argument that the city makes is that they're, uh, they have to be, be attractive as a bond issuer to Wall Street. And so uh -huh. one of the things they're doing is dressing up their income statement and balance sheets with all of these reserves so that they look more attractive. Uh, but in terms of statutory requirements and other uh, measurements they are over reserving by something like 150 million dollars and uh, the, the other piece of this that we were you know that's that that's that particular argument uh, that they, they need to do this uh, so we've kind of put, put the end of that the other piece uh, the internal services fund which is another place where they individual departments charge each other for services that are uh, used uh, as time has gone on, they've been squirreling money away in these internal service funds as well, so that uh, even though a department uh, would be uh, charging money uh, for a service provided, 
they're actually reserving far more than is necessary for this, the amount of services that are going to be requested. Uh, an example of that is in the transportation fund. In the transportation fund, uh, they've, uh, as the, the monies have decreased that we're getting from the state, through because of gas tax revenue and, and all of that decreasing, we've been stressing the transportation budget and not doing a road improvements and, and the like. And that's all being caused by the fact that they're continuing to reserve at the budgeted level out of the transportation fund, even though they're not getting the transportation money is not the same as it, as it as was budgeted. So they're reserving at a an unrealistic level for okay. the transportation. So they're budget. they're reserving a larger percentage of the money that they got. Uh, Correct. At least relative to, to historically what they've done. Right. So they're over reserving in that particular uh -huh. fund, and they're over reserving uh, on the, on their internal services fund. So there's a lot of a lot of liquidity being built up in the budget. So. When you see these these uh, hail mary passes that the mayor does at the end of the budget cycle to save jobs, uh -huh. yeah, that's this whole this whole thing is kind of the the uh, the scarcity mantra that we start back in September. You know, they they get all of the departments to tell the people who they're going to cut and sure. all of the jobs are going positions are going to save, and then right at the last minute they pull it out, they grab it out of the hat. Now, this year it's interesting. They did one additional rabbit came out of the hat, and that is a span of control issue, and that is that they um, apparently are cleaning up the uh, management of finance, uh, 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 management and finance office in the city government that was doing a four to one span of control, and now they're going to so, closer to the state uh, mandate of 11 to one. Okay, span of control, what are you talking about? Uh, that is the number of Per people that a particular manager manages. Oh, okay. is, is that's their span of control. Manager so to employee ratio. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you for cleaning that sure, up for yeah. me, David. Yeah, span of control. <laughs> yeah. Okay, all right, good. But okay. anyway, so, that, so if you, the, the news in the paper was that the uh, budget and finance was going to be taking a big hit this year mm -hmm. uh, in terms of that. And so there's some of that going on, but uh, the, it's historically those jobs don't go away; they're just reallocated someplace. Uh, and okay, so we'll right, have to see yeah. that. We'll have to see how that goes. Okay, and um, t tell me a little bit more about who was involved with with this community assembly. Okay. okay, so all of this planning has been going on for several months, and uh, with a, a bunch of dedicated people, some great people we've worked with. Then on May 5th, we had the actual community assembly, and we had it at the First Unitarian Church, and we had 80-plus folks show up from a broad range of labor, community, Occupy, uh, participate in this assembly, which included uh, kind of some, spe some speechifying, but also uh, some uh, uh, community uh, campaigns being put forth and some of the wonkish stuff, the, the, the showing about how the money, how the budget works and where the money is, and putting all that together in a roundtable kind of discussion format that allowed us to build a lot of information and ideas from those 80 plus people about how to proceed in the future. We had uh, uh, some great participants, but we had folks from, say, Opal. Uh, Michael mentioned transportation about transportation equity because, you know, uh, fares are going up and and uh, uh, the usage is being limited, and that affects poor people the most. Mm -hmm. And so Opal is for transportation equity to keep the fares down and to have the service expanded, not reduced. Um, we had. Uh, folks talking about Right to Dream 2, which is the houseless advocacy group that has uh, an encampment for people to safely rest and sleep down on Burnside, and the city is fining them rather than supporting them monetarily. Right. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, so talked about that issue and the issue, the broader issue of foreclosure and that sort of thing. We had uh, two parents and one of the a daughter of one of the parents uh, of Harriet Tubman School, which was closed down because of budgeting issues. And again, that's a school in a low-income, uh, uh, largely uh, African-American and, and non-white kind of community. So again, the people who are suffering from these budgets, budget cuts, are the people who should be being lifted and supported. Uh, so we went through that, uh, the, the community assembly, and felt very good about uh, that process, and now we're uh, developing a continuation committee 
to uh, not only kind of uh, figure out where to go from there with uh, the specific what happened at the assembly, but how to attack not only the city budget, which we used to start with as a local focus, but the county and the state and the federal budgets and how they're all part of this model mm -hmm. uh, that is a really a corporate model and uh, leading towards privatization. There's a real attack on public sector jobs. There's been an attack forever on unions, private and public, but now the public uh, unions who have brought us the 40-hour week and benefits and all of the things that we take for granted is being decimated by this, this process. So we want community and labor to work together to fight back against this, and that's what the assembly, the idea of the assembly is to, to go forward to how can we build a campaign around this uh, towards direct action with the city and look at the, uh, the broader picture of how, how we change this systemic model that is built for the 1% against the 99%. Do you anticipate that uh, when the new budget comes up, assuming that this one we're talking about now will be approved, and then w what's the next steps for you? Well, you? <laughs> part of it is what we're going to be talking about. I think that this, uh, this program will be uh, aired after we have our first continuations meeting. We've mm -hmm. had our organizing, our planners meeting uh, subsequent to the uh, community assembly, but now we're doing something to invite the broad public uh, and uh, uh, to a meeting that's coming up shortly, and by the time this is aired, we'll have another one scheduled. Okay. So people should check uh, check the website uh, that will be available. Yeah. Do you recall uh, what that website is? Uh, I don't no, have the I website. Actually, I have it. I, ha I have it here. Okay. Uh, PortlandWiki. dot org slash ca. Yeah. Okay. And we'll have that up on the screen at the end. Great. Okay. I appreciate that. Yeah. And and then so we and and one of the ideas is that we start going to city council in September when they start talking about it and say you're not going to do this behind closed doors anymore. You're going to do it transparently and participatorily mm -hmm. with the community, um, and you know take take our democracy back a mm -hmm. little bit. Yeah. Are there any uh, any other national models for what you're doing? Well, there are certainly international models. This, this whole uh, idea of democratizing the budget process started back uh, in the Spanish Civil War, but it has recently, in, in the last uh, 10 years, uh, found uh, a foothold in uh, Brazil, uh, Porto Alegre, uh, where they actually took over 40% of the city's budget hmm. and were able to go through. They, they got a couple of people who were interested in this process into leadership positions in their in their um, municipal area and were able to take over 40% of the city's budget and plan it for the for the use of the people who needed it and not the people who were sending it off to Swiss bank accounts. And that was Brazil? That was in Brazil. Okay. And there actually are some uh, local areas, and I'm not going to be able to rem remember them right now, but in, in uh, the United States, they recently had a, a small process of $4 million that was done in New York, uh -huh. and uh, they were able to do some local planning. But what happens is we have the similar thing here where the city comes in March after they've done all the, the planning, they come to us and they say, we have a $14 million shortfall, do you want to, <laughs> do you want to have your, your community centers or do you want to have your swimming pool or you know, yeah. that kind uh -huh. of stuff. And it's just the, it's the most insulting thing that I've been through in a while. Okay. It was, uh, but anyway, there, there are models for that and, and uh, we're hoping to build a model for American cities in terms of how you go about dealing with this problem. Mm -hmm. and, and we'll see how we do, okay. but I think we're, we're on the way. Just following up on what Michael said, I mean, one of the things that is aggravating about this is that the city council comes and says, okay, we're going to either cut you 8, 6, or 4 percent or something like that. They don't even consider the possibility of not having cuts to these programs and raising other revenue or cutting tax breaks and cutting subsidies to the rich or changing how they do urban renewal. They don't even consider that. They don't even put it on the table, mm -hmm. which is why it's important for us to intervene in their process early and say, well, what about this? What about taxing the rich more? You know, and they say, oh, we need these businesses to come in, otherwise we can't have jobs. It's the same kind of trickle-down crap. Excuse my language. Okay. I'd use, I'd use stronger right. language <laughs> under, in other circumstances. But it's the same kind of thing that we see nationally and globally. 
and basically it's uh, just a way to privatize to, to the race to the bottom, to lower wages and benefits, uh, to maximize profit, and, and we're buying into the same thing locally. And we don't need these big shiny projects. What we need is our streets to be taken, to be fixed, our mm -hmm. transportation to be m expanded, uh, our jobs to be created, our environment to be protected, and uh, get you know, end this uh, fossil fuel economy that we're living on, and move into a healthy uh, energy economy. And that would create millions of jobs uh, throughout the world. Mm -hmm. And and. Here in Portland, we could do retrofits, we could do um, uh, solar panel uh, feed-in tariffs and things like that, which I know you've done programs on before right. and mm -hmm. are familiar with. There's all of these opportunities to grow our economy in a healthy way. And uh, we're tired of having it <laughs> be in that old model. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we want to build a movement to say no more. Right. Right. Good. And so I, I sense that this probably would not have happened if Occupy Wall Street and Occupy Portland wouldn't, you know, if they didn't exist. Yeah. Would that be fair to say? Well, I, in 30 I think. Seconds? Th yeah, I think <laughs> that there are there are a couple of things that you can look at in the current popular movements. Uh, many of us have been working for years and years and years on various projects, and the presence of Occupy has permitted all of us to Come combine together. our forces together, mm -hmm. and it's pushing things over the top and. Community assembly is one example. Your uh, the move to amend that we got uh, pushed through um, through city council was another where Occupy has permitted us to just get over the hump. Right. And I think that's what's capacity going on. and uh -huh. solidarity. Yeah. Right, Greg. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Dave. Michael. Thank, thank you. you. All right. <laughs> Good. All right. So we've been talking with uh, Greg Mar Margolis and Michael Wade, and we're talking about uh, community assembly for uh, planning the city's budget. And there, um, on your screen now, you'll see a uh, a website, PortlandWiki.org/ca, if you want to uh, learn more about this movement here in Portland or to become involved with it. If you're watching this episode and would like to see it again, or if you've missed the past episodes, you can now do so. Uh, Populist Dialogues is now on YouTube. Go to YouTube.com and search for Populist Dialogues. Click on the result with the Statue of Liberty icon to view all our shows this year and to subscribe to the series. We're also on blip.tv, that's B-L-I-P.tv. Search for Populist Dialogues and subscription there is also available. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. We want to thank our crew today, Roger Bates, Joan Horton, Dave King, Beth Kerwin, and Janet Morris. And I want to thank the audience for watching, and hope that you'll watch us again next week. Bye. <laughs>